CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. For the record, this is the March 19th, 2024 meeting of the Arlington Artificial Turf Study Committee. Um, thank you for everyone who's here. And I know Joe's going to be uh, just a few minutes late today. Um, so, you know, we kept the agenda for this meeting very, oh, well, I know we're going to have to do some preliminaries, but I, I guess I'll say something before we get into that. We kept the agenda for this meeting um, relatively short um, because uh, the work continues uh, with Natasha and me trying to pull all the different strands together and make this uh, a report that uh, that flows and sounds like it speaks with one voice. Um, but uh we really need to finish the conversation we started last week. And so that's going to be the primary focus of this meeting, as you can tell from the agenda. And we'll take as long as it takes to, to have that conversation, but I'm hopeful that it will, this is not going to be a two or three hour meeting, that this will be a, re a relatively efficient and succinct meeting, I hope. Um, so, uh, but to the agenda, uh, acceptance of meeting minutes. I hope everyone had a chance to read the minutes from last week. I thought Natasha did a great job with them, uh, synthesizing and, and uh, reporting on our back and forth on all the topics of conversation. Um, if everyone's had a chance to look at them, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to accept the minutes. Second. There's a second. Okay. So motion by Jill, second by Marvin. Yes. yes. Okay. And, uh, Thank you all on. for reviewing those. Those were a little challenging to write, so um, I appreciate it. Okay. All right. So, oh, I got to go down the line. So I told you I'm totally out of sorts. <laughs> um, okay. So, Mike? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jill Barr, not present yet. Um, Mike said, yeah. Uh, who else is in that group? Um, that does not okay. Um, Marvin, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Natasha, yes. Jill, yes. Okay. Um, Leslie, yes. And Jim, yes. Okay. So the motion passes six to zero uh, with one absent. And I think I just got a notification that someone joined. So um, motion passes. Um, I just want to say before I get to the next item on the agenda, it is, I think Natasha said this last week, but it seems even more um, noticeable this week. It's so great to see everyone with so much natural light behind them in their various offices, uh, home or or otherwise. It's uh, especially Natasha. I'm not used to use without overhead lights and it's, it's wonderful to see. Um, so next item is correspondence received, which I believe we received a lot of it. Um, especially because it included some correspondence that just missed our cutoff from the prior agenda. So do you want to give us a quick rundown of yeah. that? So um, we had two emails from um, Robin Bergman. Uh, the first was uh, an article, plastics, uh, plastic found inside more than 50% of um, uh something clogs the arteries, uh, plaques uh, from clogged arteries, I'm sorry. And then the second one was um, how PFAS microplastics join force, forces as a synthetic, uh, I'm sorry, a synergetic uh, threat. The second email was from Beth Malofchik, uh, and that was uh, in regards to turf fields may have forever chemicals, um, should kids be playing on them? It was an article and there was a reference to, uh, I believe it was Green Arlington. Um, and then the third email was from Mike Guild's game uh, from our committee, and he was forwarding on the um, PDF version of the wetland value table. Uh, and I believe that it got mixed up in translation in, in last week's um, uh, packet. So that's why he was re-forwarding it. Uh, and that's all I had for correspondence received. Excellent. Um, so at this point, Unless anyone has anything else, I think we should just move to the next item on the agenda, which is a continuation of our discussion about uh, recommendations and conclusions. So 
you know, just to give you kind of a sense of where we are, and then I'll obviously turn it over to the rest of the group. But, you know, Natasha and I are making very strong progress, although it's taking a long time, a lot longer than we had expected, but probably should have expected to just uh, pull each of the narratives together. And each of the narratives is quite strong. And I believe fairly consistent uh, themes sort of run through uh, the different narratives, but just you know, putting them in a format and in a having each of the topics kind of flow naturally one from the other with proper headings, of course, it's, it's just, it's a task. It's a task because, you know, um, what we're trying to avoid, I think I've said this before is to have, to have someone read this report and say, it looks like it was written by a committee. Um, I mean, everyone will know it was written by a committee, but I don't want them to actually think it reads like it was written by a committee, um, which is usually an insult. So, uh, you know, I think we're close and we're certainly working really, really hard that by Friday morning, you will receive a full draft copy for comment. There's just things that are taking longer and we'll talk about that on the next agenda item, like little things like getting the citations kind of in a common format and getting the spacing in a common format, just various things that we can continue the work even after we share the draft, but we want to try to send you something that's in as close to final form as possible by the end of this week. Uh, and we'll talk about timeline and future deliverables in the next item. But the, if we do nothing else at this meeting, the most important thing is to continue and hopefully wrap up our discussion about possible findings and recommendations. Um, so to recap where we were, and I think Natasha's minutes did a good job of this, but to recap where we sort of stopped, we we're having a discussion about various pieces that might be part of a findings and recommendations section at the end. And there were, there was a consensus among, I think everyone on the committee that there was, although people have different views about turf, some people are more positive towards it, some people are more negative, but no one on the committee was endorsing a moratorium on artificial turf. Um, that's not to say people didn't have a lot of cautionary notes about it. And we will talk about those cautionary notes and potential qualifiers and caveats and things we want to be clear in the report. But just to clarify, no one in the committee believed that a moratorium was appropriate. And in terms of crumb rubber, that was the next subject we covered. And on crumb rubber, no one on the committee really felt strongly that we should continue to if we did have artificial turf fields ever in Arlington uh, or new artificial turf fields, I should say, not things that have not already been built or not already in the process of being built or, or procured, that there was not a healthy, there was not an appetite for future fields uh, that are not currently in the planning process to have crumb rubber infill. Um, but Jill, I'll let you jump in there. I think there, I hadn't thought about this until the discussion. Um, I think, you know, this whole conversation started with the exclusion of the um, Arlington High School field. Um, but we have those two turf fields, Arlington High School, which will be new and have a 10 years lifespan. And I don't know the lifespan on the Arlington Catholic field. Um, but if we are going to say new fields, is new fields new from grass to turf? Or when Arlington High School, Arlington Catholic, and I guess eventually Arlington High School goes to replace their crumb rubber turf, are we going to ask them to move to alternative materials? Um, what is the timeline on that? Is there any ability for them to be grandfathered in? What I would worry about as a, as a parent is, let's say Arlington Catholic is forced to move to a synthetic material and that cost is 20% more, that they actually overuse their field and don't don't replace it when it should be replaced because of the cost difference. So I think there would there would need to be maybe some flexibility there. Um, and certainly if we're if we're not talking about the replacement of current turf fields, then that's a whole different discussion. Um, Before we go further on that, I think 
I'm hoping someone on this call can clarify something for me, if it's particularly about the Malden Catholic, I'm sorry, the Arlington Catholic field. Um, jurisdictionally, I don't know how much power we have over that. It's not a town piece of property. Um, so I'm not sure how much leeway we have legally or jurisdictionally to prevent them from putting in another artificial turf field. I mean, I suppose if you had a town, well, I guess this is, I, I look to, before I say anything, I may may regret uh, or may sound foolish. I'm looking to someone for guidance here in the committee about, about our powers and responsibilities with respect to Arlington Catholic and its field. Wetlands. Conservation Commission has uh, approved that field. Because there's a wetland component. So then, Ledley, is that to say that Conservation Commission, if they were going to replace it, it would be something that would have to go before them? That's my understanding. They had to go before them to put it in. Conservation so Commission is... approved both of those fields. Millbrook runs under those fields, also under um, Buzzle Field. And I believe that they have a jurisdiction, a jurisdictional component to any building that goes on on any of those fields is my understanding. I mean, Mike would probably know better. Uh, David definitely would. And I see Mike has his hand up. Well, Mike has his hand up. I'll go with Mike and then someone else wants to jump in after him. All right, thanks. Yeah, two, two quick points. Yes, uh, and I'll leave the jurisdictional issue to David. Um, the uh, I wanted to make two points. One, I wanted to thank everyone for your comments on our uh, draft submitted, um, and I provided Jim and Natasha with some uh, updated language uh, for our section of the report, which I assume at some point will get shared out. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was that um, while we have uh, approved, while the Conservation Commission has approved uh, back in, I think, 2019 or 2020, uh, those fields, I think there may be some interest in reviewing the infill of crumb rubber to see if there isn't an alternative that we might want to think about, given all of the new information in the last three or four years that has come out uh, about that, uh, that substance. Um, so I just leave that here and I don't know if David, you want to comment on the existing, um, uh, fields that are, have been approved. Yeah, both the Arlington Catholic and the Arlington high school sites are jurisdictional to conservation commission. And I, I don't know off the top of my head, all of the jurisdictional areas that are in, but, um, at least riverfront area, which is 200 feet on either side of Mill Brook in both cases. Yeah, well, so it sounds like in theory, the town does have, well, before I say anything more, Joe, you have your hand up. Um, I was just gonna say, I mean, and apologies for the background noise, the, um, I mean, the other option, the other, source of control is funding right so obviously we have no funding control of our own catholic uh we do have i mean the schools are complicated because they are legally a separate entity but from a funding perspective they get their funding from the town so like they're not you know outside the context of something like a debt exclusion for the high school you know they're going to need to come to the town for funding for you know replacement of the field if that's required some point. So if the town had a policy of, you know, we only will fund this type of infill or this type of field or whatever it was, then that the the you know the the capital planning process would be the other sort of quote unquote enforcement mechanism. Um I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any other example of something where we enforce requirements through that. And nothing's jumped into my mind, but I'll I'll think about that and see if there's any examples of that. Well, I mean, I do think that this committee has generally been very skeptical of crumb rubber infill. But having said that, I think there's a general 
So jump in if I'm getting any of this wrong or if anyone disagrees. Um, but I also think though we see upside and big potential with alternative infills, I think there's some of them are still fairly new and there aren't a lot of long-term studies on them. I mean, crumb rubber infill for, for better or worse has been around a while. We know a lot about it. Unfortunately, what we know is rather a mixed story uh, or maybe not a mixed story, maybe you know a slightly negative story. But it's 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 sort of what you know because it's around and it's common. Other infills, as we heard from Ian, you know, cork. People talk about cork. He said, "Well, you know, cork sounds good until it rains and it expands, and you get problems with that." So, I mean, there are, are potential ones with potential huge upsides, like you know, green sand and and um, brock fill potentially. But you know, I mean, I think just in general, we. We see the we see the potential of alternative infills, but we we can't necessarily endorse any of these at this point, given the state of research on them. I mean, is that are you all sort of generally agree with that, or am I getting this wrong? Joe? Yeah. I, so um, again, just take a, a step back and just some of the conversation about the jurisdiction. Um, and what the town really has control over when it comes to Arlington Catholic. I just want to be clear, and this is something that we certainly brought up, the Park Commission brought up when this whole process started a couple of years ago. Almost all of our fields, and just so we're understanding, and are all within Conservation Commission jurisdiction. And so not all of them, but the ones that would probably be under consideration for artificial turf are all under Conservation Commission jurisdiction in some manner. Um, McLennan, heard um, uh, Basel, um, uh, Thorndike, uh, Magnolia, uh, the high school, I don't know, the Catholic. Um, oh, you know, I think those are the poets. So, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> all of this, quite frankly, no matter what we decide or a recommendation has to go in front of the Conservation Commission um, so I think that, you know, it's going to have, it's going to need conservation commission approval in, you know, one way or the other. So there's going to be town controls over, um, whatever infill is recommended. Just want everyone to be clear. Cause if you look at all the parcels purely under park and rec, very, 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 very limited as to, um, you know, what, in the very small, to be honest with you, what we might consider on our own without Conservation Commission's oversight, be able to put turf in. So I just wanted to set the table on, on that. Thanks. Well, just to clarify, so Joe, you're sort of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying that you don't think the Conservation Commission would be terribly open to? That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yes, in a, for future projects that aren't aren't currently underway, it's it's sort of less less maybe what our preference is and more just the reality is that it's you have to go with kind of whether you can have a consensus, and that there's probably not a consensus that future projects um, or. or future fields that aren't already built should be built with crumb, you know, with crumb rubber and fill. Yeah, because, um, and I'm not yeah, sure, why, I, you know, again, I'll, I'll raise it that I don't know why we, it was excluded as part of the conversation, those two fields, existing fields, black crumb rubber, that's the pushback that we consistently received from the public when um, anytime the Park and Rec Commission had any type of conversation. We had people showing up with cupfuls of black crumb rubber, black crumb rubber. So it was excluded in the conversation that we just had at town meeting last year that resulted in this study committee. I believe that we, as, as you pointed out, Jim, there's a general consensus that we don't believe uh, as a committee, cr black crumb rubber is necessarily a positive when it comes to um, 
artificial turf. So my question, I, you know, I, I, I'm questioning, are we just turning, you know, what is, what is our guidance then relative, you know, are we just ignoring those two fields the way um, last year's town meeting question did and turning a blind eye to what we found and what our preference is or should there be some sort of um, recommendation and if not from this committee then how is it handled and how is that not how we would handle future discussions about any of the potential for other fields. Mike? I think you're on mute, Mike. Yeah, thank you. I, I think Leslie's brought up a very important point uh, and it emphasizes for me the importance of looking at site by site to see what the conditions are, what the options are, and to do a thorough study at both on environmental and human health and, and safety issues. Uh, for each proposed site. I do think that it's been, uh, as Jim and Leslie and everybody seems to be thinking, that uh, crumb rubber uh, is probably uh, a very, very good surface for playing on, but has some negative effects that we brought out in our report and other people have as well. Um, and I, that's why I mentioned at the outset that I think that while these two fields have been uh, approved under 2019 or 20 uh, information, uh, those may need to be revisited based on our current information in terms of uh, at least the infill. Uh, and, uh, you know, the town's jurisdiction um, uh, and bylaws and regulations uh, have been updated since 2019. Uh, and DEP's regulations are, I think, have been updated since then. But they certainly looking at it now. So I think we do have to see what the current status of knowledge is regarding uh, whatever we propose for a particular site. I think what Mike and Leslie are saying makes a lot of sense. However, I, I'm i very hesitant to make, I mean, I, I've, I've tried to emphasize in this discussion the emphasis on future projects, projects that aren't underway. And by underway, I mean, I don't mean necessarily shovels in the ground. I mean, you know, procurement process is completed. Um, you know, the thing with artificial turf fields is like it or not, every eight to 10 years, you get another bite at the apple to, to rethink what you want to do. And although, you know, we may be hesitant about the fact that there's two fields in town, and I say two, I realize the high school is more than one field, but you know, I'm gonna say two places in town where there are artificial turf fields that are still have crumb rubber or are going to still have crumb rubber. I'm very hesitant to make anything that this committee says applicable to those, considering that that's never really been part of the discussion, either, either when this debate happened in town meeting or in our own discussions, but, I want to be sure I'm where everyone else in this committee is comfortable. So it would not be applicable to stuff underway, but when Arlington High School in 10 years or Arlington Catholic in I don't know how many years goes to replace, we would expect them to. Well, well I mean, we're not, I mean, we don't have the power to mandate anything, but we can, we can make a recommendation that, you know, yes, there should be a strong push in whatever procurement process to get a non-crumb rubber. That doesn't mean, you know, I, I don't think I necessarily say never say never on crumb rubber, but the strong emphasis should be, the default position should be a non-crumb rubber infill for future projects. I mean, are people comfortable with that? Obviously with the, with the understanding that we need to see what the research on alternative infills, ultimately how it all pans out. It's very promising, has potential, in five to 10 years, there'll be a lot more research on this and hopefully it meets the potential. Um, you know, but with that qualifier, are people comfortable with a 
recommendation like that. Jim, if I just have one quick question, um, and this is to, to Mike, if I could put Mike on the spot for a little bit. Um, so when, when we first started this process, again, the Park Commission's intention was to go project by project. And the at the time, the Conservation Commission was looking to update their wetland regulations and was discussing potentially putting language in their wetland regulations, pretty much prohibiting turf. And they decided at the time to not um, uh, put the language in at that time because we were going through the turf forum and having conversations at town meeting about the pluses and minus of artificial turf. Um, but they always held the right, certainly, to go back and revise their wetland regulations and and change them accordingly. So my question to Mike is, has there been any conversation um, in the Conservation Commission that they're going to take our report recommendations under consideration, you know, like looking at potential wetland regulation changes? Do you know what I mean? Like, are they going to be looking at what we recommend based on our findings to make any, you know, potential changes or not to the wetland regulations? Thanks, Jim. Uh, Joe, I, I think the, uh, the Conservation Commission is aware, obviously, of these fields, and uh, there has been, not been any discussion that I recall, and David can correct me, on jumping one way or the other regarding this report. Uh, I think the uh, existing bylaw in the town, as well as DP's uh, regulations and our own regulations, uh, do speak to uh, different levels of concern depending on what the potential impact is to the wetland resources uh, in the town. So uh, we haven't, uh, I don't believe the commission has made any decision on how we will approach this report that's coming out. Uh, because obviously this report is non-jurisdictional in the sense that it doesn't make laws itself, but right. will uh, perhaps influence what the town decides to do. Okay, no, thanks, appreciate it. Marvin? I, I guess if if I kind of take off my committee hat and just think, you know, I'm a town meeting member, I'm reading this report, um, and, you know, we, we are going to recommend that, you know, crumb not be used going forward on new fields, I think it would be kind of, for me, the, you know, kind of a logical question would be, well, what about fields that have been ordered and not installed yet? Um, I mean, to me, that just that seems like a question that's likely to come up. Um, it's a legitimate and, question, but you know, and, I, and and there may there may you know there may be no option to do anything differently than you know than than what's been already specified. Um, but if we think that crum is not a great thing to be using, um, should we at least? suggest if there are alternatives that are available that can go in, for example, at the high school, um, you know, and it can be done, you know, within the existing budget. I mean, obviously, we're not going to, you know, blow up the budget for stuff. I mean, I know how hard that is to to pass every year. My understanding, and I may be very wrong, but after having talked to very well informed people about the high school field is we should not confuse the fact that shovels aren't in the ground with the fact that there is still leeway for a change. My understanding is that for, at this point, shovels are fairly imminent and for them to change the infill for the projects, the fields at the high school would require change orders, which would essentially bust the budget for the project. I mean, they, they, you know, I mean, I don't know how much they'd be starting for square one, but, you know, we all know that this project has been years in the making. Every single line item has been, you know, poured over and, and, and I, sweated I, over. Um, so I, I know we hear some things in the comments. We hear some, my understanding, and I could be very wrong, but the people I talk to seem, seem to be in a position to know a lot about these things is 
there there's very little that I think can be done without without messing up a lot of procurement. Right. And, and and I think and I you know and I'm I'm okay with that. You know, I just I just think that we should be you know perhaps prepared to explain that if yeah if, that's if fair stuff. that's fair. And I don't know whether whether that should be something to that effect should maybe be included in the report just so it I think that's fair too. Me. Because I don't want I don't want us to look like we're ducking what yep. seems to be an obvious issue. I think that's and and I think that any you know to Leslie's point, you know, we're the place that that pretty much turf related recommendations should come from. I mean, if it's not from us, who the hell else is it going to come from? You know, I mean, presumably we've done the work and and looked at everything, so it just you know it seems logical for. I think that. I see Joe, Joe Barr's hand up. I wonder if he has. Um, I don't know much about I don't employees, but I don't know much about the process. Um, Joe, I don't know. Do you know much about the procurement process, or you might have your hand up for another reason? Yeah. No, no. I was going to say. So it was a construction manager at risk project, and typically that means it's extremely difficult to change the scope after the fact. Um, so even something that seems simple, like changing the infill, I think would trigger a whole series of questions. And so, I mean, it's worth talking to, I don't know if it's Alex McGee or to someone from the the, the, the school building committee um, to just make sure, but I'd be shocked if there wasn't a whole can of worms that got open if we tried to investigate that. But it's worth trying to run that to ground just to to the point that was just made by, I guess, Marvin, that you know we, we should at least try to not be act as if we were not aware of the issue. We will address it. We will not dwell on it, but we will address it in the report. And you can see how well how well we do, we do at it in the draft. And you can tell us if we did a lousy job or if we can do better. Well, if that's the route we're going to take, that speaks even more to me, to what Mike was saying about decisions being made on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, in this case, it sounds like with the high school project that there may be reasons to stick with, and they may be economic reasons, certainly not health, safety, or environmental, but economic reasons to stay with the plan as uh, determined. But I think, again, that goes to what Mike was saying in looking at these, you know, decisions on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, what is planned? What are the upsides and downsides of a particular location? Um, if we're not going to say, you know, if we're not going to say blanket, crumb rubber is bad we don't think we should be using crumb rubber in town, then I'm not sure what we can say, because I think that was something that was, you know, generally, I got the sense, generally felt to be the big downside of this generation of turf products was the use of black crumb rubber. And that, you know, some of these other, you know, while we may not know um, and studies are incomplete around many other things, um, the black crumb rubber seem to be the pretty universally something that could be agreed on as a negative. David? I think that the decisions pertaining to the existing or about to exist fields are, as, as Jim's pointed out, a bit beyond the scope and also uh, sort of different from the task at hand in as much as we're thinking about prioritizing for the future. <laughs> Sorry, I have a party crasher here. Um, so I think part of our responsibility then is to 
evaluate the criteria that we're um, prioritizing and to make recommendations based on whether we think that the economic arguments, which may well still have some degree of uh, relevance, whether those trump fire health and safety or uh, environmental concerns, et cetera. And what I've heard of this group so far, they don't. Um, we would definitely opt for something different um, in order to ensure protections on all of those fronts. So I'm not sure if I was clear because I had a four-year-old in my lap, but I, I hope that's, I don't know, clarifying. Yeah. Mike? Yes. Uh, as I pointed out, just as a small note, early in this process, one of the towns that I contacted uh, said that they did not look at environmental or safety issues. They made a purely economic decision to uh, go the way they went. So I think we would not be um, uh, alone in the world in terms, terms of looking at the economics as a main point. But I think that there's also obviously in this committee concern about safety, health, and, and environmental issues. <clears throat> it's the balance that's the hard part. Yes. I think this has been helpful. I wanna move us to the next item. Um, unless someone wants to jump in here. I mean, I think the best way I can leave this for now is um, let's see how Natasha and I do on this. <laughs> and then you you tell us if we got if we got the essence of this discussion and sort of captured where the committee is or if we failed miserably. Um, but let us take a stab at this. And I think, I think I have a sense of where the committee is, but um, read the report and let me know if I'm, if Natasha and I are stuck out in left field here. My sense is, Jim, that uh, this committee is not reticent to express opinions, <laughs> so I'm sure yeah, you'll no hear. One, no one's going to be shy if we get it wrong. So, um, so the next piece, which I think there's. We haven't talked about all that much, but we have talked about it. And and by the way, so you know, when I bring up an issue, there's two sets of things to think about each issue. One is should should we even be addressing this? But that's sort of the, the fundamental foundational question. And then the second is if we should be addressing this, you know, what should we be saying on it? Um, but I believe there's been general agreement on on the PFAS, well, on one particular part of the PFAS issue, that to the extent when one orders an artificial turf field that you can get a certification from the manufacturer, from the factory that it's PFAS free, all the better. Um, now we know that that doesn't always mean it's 100, you know, it's PFAS free and we there's been debate about what PFAS free as certified by the manufacturer or the factory sending it out actually means, but, and maybe that's right. I don't want to say putting that to the side, but, but that's relevant to the discussion, but I guess is there agreement on the committee that a requirement if, and when we ever had an artificial turf field, in addition to the other pieces we've talked about should, should be that the, the strong, strong preference or requirement should be that the manufacturer certifies that it's PFAS free. Yes, again, accepting the existing projects, I guess, is the message. Mm -hmm. Well, I yeah. That we're gonna have to put that caveat on anything we say then, based on our prior discussion. So we don't know that either of the two existing fields are PFAS free or have been certified or will be certified to be PFAS free, but, what think, we're saying is if we ignore those two projects going forward, then that should be a standard. Yep. Yeah, I think that's that sounds good. I the only caveat I would throw with that is that uh that that 
PFAS free certification should come from an independent laboratory, not from the manufacturer, because as we've seen, that doesn't always give us the answer we are hoping for. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Mike, it should, the, I think it's um, one step further that uh, there should be testing, required testing should be done um, at, the, at the manufacturer level prior to shipping. Because I, from what I understand, as soon as it lands on site, you know, if it's and then tested, if it could have rained that night, it could have rained in transport, and mm -hmm. it could have PFAS in it from the atmosphere. So I would just say that you know we we can build into the specifications, you know, testing requirements that need to be done by an independent laboratory um, before it 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 ships. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep, I agree with Joe on that. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, that one seemed uh, relatively. <laughs> I mean, I think we also. I mean, my, you know, I don't want to snatch victory from the jaws of de you know, de defeat from the jaws of victory here, but um, you know, I think we all have to be honest about what PFAS free means. You know, I mean, it, it, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no PFAS at all in this field it just means well it means to the extent possible they're certifying that there's no i mean, I mean there's sort of an acceptance that pfas is in everything right right you there know? could there are, could be we haven't tested we don't know yeah. there could be yeah. pfas in our in existing um in our existing fields oh yeah. i'm sure there is i'm but, sure there is so you um, you could you could potentially yeah. go to a field that you're doing test it and find pfas yeah, but this is, I still think, better, better than nothing, a lot better than nothing, and gives some assurances, however minimal or or maximal they are, um, that their the field doesn't have anything worse than the norm. I guess being introduced. Yeah, it's worse than the control introduced. group. Right, David. to the point about sort of minimal assurances and the discussion that's happened previously about what PFAS free means. I wonder if we could make a recommendation about sort of carefully considering what that designation means. Um, I don't know if we can do anything stronger than that necessarily, but it feels like, you know, closely parsing, like what are the accepted levels? What are the uh, regulatory standards for PFAS in the environment or in any, like, I don't know, health products, whatever you want to point to as a standard there might be a threshold that we specify or we might look to some future deciding authority to set that threshold and to have some clarity about what PFAS free means. And I would also just caution that we're not just talking about PFAS group of chemicals, we're talking about a, a longer list that we may want to also uh, include in that because we know that there are, and we're discovering new ones all the time, but there's certainly more than just PFAS to be concerned about. Marvin? I, I, I guess I don't see why we can't make a recommendation, um, you know, that the field carpets be tested at the manufacturer prior to shipping. Um, to me, at least, you know, based on, on the technology we have. I mean, I'm really concerned about kind of soft peddling recommendations to the point where they'll be meaningless. Um, and it results in, you know, exposure to toxic materials. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I definitely am in favor of, of what you described and what Joe suggested. I'm okay. thinking that we might go a step further even and say, you know, whichever body is going to decide in the future about installing a field, that they examine what that 
certification means, like what level of PFAS are they accepting, what chemicals are uh, comprising that category of PFAS, does it include all of the ones that are emerging now as a concern, like Mike just described, are the levels above or below a given regulatory standard from a different context, like mm -hmm. soils health or um, human health, et cetera, et cetera. D does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the issues is that there really aren't any standards except for in drinking water. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, those may shift over time, but again, there is exposure, you know, unrelated to, to drinking water that, you know, would be nice to prevent. So, you know, this is this is the other problem that, you know, that the health group ran into, that um, there are not, there have not yet been defined levels, you know, kind of at what body burden for, you know, PFAS, for phthalates or other materials, you know, can you say, you know, this is harmful to health, this is not harmful to health. We know that more exposure is more harmful than less exposure. Um, and so to me, we ought to do what we reasonably can, um, you know, just, just to make, you know, whatever product we buy, um, you know, that it's, it's, as, it's as safe as practicable at the time of purchase. You know, I mean, none of us know what's gonna happen 10 years from now. You know, well, I, and then, and, I certainly and then. am not gonna know, you know, what, what's likely to come out, but, you know, we can at least say on the day that we're signing a contract, you know, we've got a, we've got a product that at least is as, as safe as, you know, we know how to buy. And, and I think that would be kind of a reasonable approach to take. I'm, I completely agree. Are we good with this one? Okay. So the next thing I have on my list is heat guidelines. Um, so to the extent that Arlington ever had, beyond its existing fields, of course, um, had artificial turf fields, synthetic turf fields, how do we feel about saying that any any such fields, if they're ever built in Arlington, need to have some fairly stringent guidelines related to uh, who, who can play on them and when with respect to heat. Essentially, it would almost sort of be requiring what is sort of already happening, or what we heard is already happening at the high school fields from from the head athletic trainer who spoke to us, uh, Samantha Jones. Um, you know, I think it can go a long way in, a, you know, assuring people that, you know, some of the more nefarious aspects of artificial turf field, which as we've seen exist, even if you're, they're not as bad, but they still exist even with alternative infills, that they're going to be hotter than a normal natural turf field if we had requirements like the MIAA, which says, you know, no one's getting on that field and playing if the wet bulb temperature is above 86.1 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or, or setting a different standard, you know, you can set something more stringent than the, than the MIAA. But in general, you know, without necessarily getting into specific, you know, wet bulb temperatures or surface temperatures or air temperatures, are people, how do people feel about, as part of our recommendations, saying that, you know, we need to, um, we need to set certain limits with respect to whether these fields get used on certain days of the year. I think that's relevant whether it's artificial turf or grass. And MIAA standards seem to be acceptable, you know, documented and acceptable to, you know, what we have. They seem reasonable. Um, they seem accepted within um, the playing, the athletic community. And I think that they do apply, as I read them, it, it doesn't matter what the surface. It's, it's you know, if, if we take as a given, and I think we all do, that, you know, there are certain days that are getting hotter than they used to. Um, 
it's not that we want to shift athletes off of our, you know, artificial turf into grass fields on a hundred degree day. We want them to be safe from heat exposure, regardless of where they play. It's an That's excellent point. Take. It's an excellent point. I agree with Leslie's point, and I wonder how that is managed, because right now the high school has an athletic trainer who is doing this testing. Um, I don't know if Joe is going to come on every Sunday and Saturday morning and test. So I I think it's the right thing to do, and I hate when thing, like recommendations are made that there is like actually no way to manage. So how do we how do we balance that? I think well, that procedurally, I think we could we could work that out similar to field closure due to rain. You know, um, we can work with the user groups and they I think most of them have a dedicated field coordinator. We could kind of shift the onus onto them once we give them the kind of the testing procedures. I think I think we could work that out. It might not be perfect. I, yeah, I, think we I don't want to get necessarily. I guess this is you know, I don't want to necessarily get hung up on this, you know, working working in a legislative body you know we always tell you don't have to decide everything this is why you have regulations you leave it to the enforcing agency to flesh out a lot of details in you know in the regulatory scheme and, and the regulations here i'm not sure we need to decide who should be the proper party you know to to be taking these temperatures or to be monitoring these sites i think it's enough for us to say if you build these fields, someone has to do that and the town that has to be, they have to make a priority that someone make that part of their job. Just leave to, it to, hear them. That, to hear that rec thinks that this is reasonable is really what I wanted to make sure. <laughs> it is, it is helpful to hear. It is like field closure and, and, you know, keeping, keeping the fields closed and teams off the fields. It, Joe doesn't do that on the weekends. Um, you know, we have to, allow for adults knowing the rules to be enforcing the rules. Well, let's be clear. The wet bulb temperature in January is not going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's hope not. I mean, if it is, then we're all in big trouble. Um, Mike. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just note that um, one of the things that we were talking about is a, is a sort of a checklist of what we want to make sure people look at uh, before a contract is signed. And I think that uh, as we heard from Ian, I think it's very important that we have something in there about good maintenance of these fields, whatever fields we're putting in, because uh, without that, the, the, the artificial turf is not going to last the full amount of time and the natural grass turf is not going to uh, live up to its res responsibility, so to speak. Um, so I think maintenance is one thing that we've heard a lot that's so important. I think, Mike, um, to that point, I, I'm working on a, a cost analysis between natural and artificial turf that we've heard from this group. And we've got lots of different information that I'm putting together. And that's one of the pieces in, in that section that talks about the importance of maintenance. So right. I think we'll cover it there. Um, but I would say that when you do give the final document a read, if you think it should be placed somewhere else, or if, if anyone does, that maybe that's you know something that you just let us know about. We'll, okay. we'll ring the bell loudly. You can tell us if we rang it loudly enough on maintenance. Excellent. Because that, that's not only a fiscal matter, but it's also potentially a safety matter. If infill isn't oh, yes. replaced and you don't have shock absorption, then, you know, so. So for a more controversial topic, um, which we have not spent very much time, any time discussing, but I did want to put it out there because I believe this was in Brookline's recommendations, a similar, similar committee in Brookline looked at this issue and made this recommendation. Um, was and and uh, Natasha, jump in if I'm getting this wrong. But they also had age guidelines related to artificial turf. I believe in Brookline they said no one K through eight would should be playing on artificial turf fields. But, you know, if 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 they had an option, they should be playing on natural turf fields, and only only people in grades nine nine and above should be playing on 
uh, any of Brookline's artificial turf fields. Am I getting that right, Natasha? Okay. That's what they said. Now, we've never really discussed this issue, um, so I'm open to views. I mean, I'm not necessarily proposing it. I'm not necessarily endorsing it, but I'm saying it is a potential guideline you can put out there. I think that's ridiculous, but <laughs> that's, why build it if you're not going to, you know, um, let the full community use it? That's when you're getting your money's worth. Um, I would be very, very curious to the science that they use to make that determination on on age. Uh, and anyone also knows who schedules fields, knows high school athletes, grades 9 to 12 athletes are on turf fields potentially six days a week as compared to youth athletes, maybe 45 minutes a week. So I have no idea where they're, they're getting that from. I think it would be relevant if we're allowing crumb because I think kids eat dirt, kids eat like little kids take all kinds of things with them. Um, I think where we're not allowing crumb, we've really already given that safety piece a look. I, I think part of this probably comes from the fact that kids are more susceptible to yeah. all kinds of, you know, adverse health effects at much lower levels than adults. That's right. But the younger the kids, um, the more profound that effect, um, you know, just from a developmental standpoint, you know, organ systems are developing, their brains are developing, um, you know, in the same way that kids are less, little kids are less able to regulate heat and kind of like can say, oh, I'm too hot, I need to sit down. Um, you know, I think that, and, and certainly there's, there's a lot of, you know, research that's been done on hand to mouth behavior, yeah. um, in children. And so that, you know, to me, um, would point to trying to keep kids from having, you know, potential exposures. And if everybody's been using crumb for the most part, that, you know, that would be a reasonable argument from my standpoint. But it's arbitrary. I think what they did was, was very arbitrary. I mean, I, I, I can see the hand to mouth on the youngest. They're not even addressing under kindergarten where you're much more likely to see that whole, you know, hand to mouth uh, digging in the dirt and, and that. Um, and in reality, the reality of the situation is that the younger kids are more likely. I mean, we're never going to have every field in town artificial turf. We're still going to have grass fields. We're still going to be playing on grass fields, and it's those. It, and it's the younger kids that cause less damage to grass fields and would be assigned to grass fields naturally anyway. So, I mean, I, I think we'd have to have a much more. I think we'd need to do a lot more research. Why are you limiting it to nine to grades nine to twelve? That just again seems very arbitrary to me, and I. I I don't think I, I would be able to support something that rigid. And and I have I, I'll admit I haven't seen any of the documentation that was used for that, so yeah. you know I can't speak to that. Um, you know the studies that I was looking at actually said one of them showed that like eight to eleven year olds actually had more hand to mouth contact than younger kids. Mm. Um, you know I think, you know. I, I, I don't know what's an appropriate cut point. I, I really, truly don't. Um, you know, I, and I guess I, this is something that to me, I would need more work before we can really say something about that. Um, or at least something I'd, I'd feel comfortable with. And, and mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's a, like a follow-up report or something. But, well, I think I, Leslie probably hit, hit on the most relevant point here, which is, is, this is a solution in search of a problem. I mean, the idea is unless every art of every turf, every field in Arlington or, you know, more than a majority of the turf uh, of the fields in Arlington become artificial turf, is this even an issue? I mean, it's it's going to be the default is that, you know, on those particularly the soccer leagues, the, the young baseball leagues, they're, they're going to be on natural turf field. You know, most I mean, that's probably where they're going to put those kids just naturally. So, and so I get the sense that this is sort of not, there's not an appetite necessarily to make this sort of recommendation considering it's a little, seems a, to the group a little arbitrary, a little undeveloped. Okay. Yes. 
recycling. Um, now, you know, there's been a lot of talk about recycling and there's been a lot of debate and not necessarily a lot of agreement on whether recycling is a viable option for artificial turf fields. Um, I think the evidence shows that yes, there's some recycling, but how widespread it is and how extensive it is is up for debate. I think Ian told us um, he was aware it was going on, but he wasn't sure how extensive. Um, I know Joe has some information on recycling that he's talked to, I think an Arlington resident who has a lot of experience in this area. Uh, but before maybe we get into the specifics, are people generally comfortable? I mean, maybe we just start with the easy part. I would assume everyone in this group, to the extent we had artificial turf fields in town, would want to the greatest extent possible that when those fields reach end of life, that they can be recycled to the greatest extent possible. Whenever they reach end of life, whatever the status of the technology is at that point. Yeah. yeah, there may be new technologies like for everything else that are coming along for that. But uh, the concern I've heard raised about the Exxon process of recycling is that it involves pyrolysis, which is essentially heating or burning the uh, materials, which in and of itself, my understanding, and I have no, no personal knowledge, but my understanding is that that not only takes fuel uh, to accomplish uh, but also results in some air issues and some waste issues. And I'm not sure to what extent that, you know, we use the word recycling as it's going to something new after it's been processed. I'm not sure to what extent that actually happens. Um, I know that there, there were some references to some companies that, that talk about sort of recycling and reusing what the product is. I'm just not sure how efficient or effective uh, that is, or what the results are, you know, from my perspective, the environment. What about the option of, um, it's a sort of the other side of the coin or where it's related on recycling. What about contractually requiring end of life responsibility when you purchase the field? Basically sure. saying to the, I mean, this is a big issue in all sorts of areas, paint, batteries, you know, charge, I mean, all these things now that, you bring to the recycling center in Arlington, they say, sorry, we, we, we don't take it. And we don't know who does try the hardware store and the hardware stores. And, you know, I mean, this is becoming an issue with lots of products, but yeah. um, I mean, are people here sort of comfortable or strongly in favor of saying whenever we buy an artificial turf field, it needs to be built into the contract that the people we're purchasing it from will take care of it at the end of life. Yeah. What, that, what does that mean? I mean, it could be that they, you know, take it to a landfill, which, you know, would not make me happy for sure. Right. You know, right. I think, I think, you know, if, if you know, if, if you want to kind of mandate some kind of recycling, but I don't know that that exists. So I don't know whether that's a viable thing to do right now, but, I, but just to say, okay, you know, you, you put it in, you gotta, you gotta deal with it after, um, you know, potentially leaves us just you know stuffing landfills full of tons of plastic well i think it depends on how you write the contract i agree with you marvin we don't want to have uh you know eighty thousand square feet of plastic uh, put into a landfill or stored in some place where it's not going to be secured um but i'm not sure what the language is uh certain lawyers or technocrats would have to make that decision but i think using the most recent effective uh, and safe technology can be built into that contract because, um, you know, if it's going to be another eight years down the road, 10 years down the road, we may discover something that we don't know now. Jim, couldn't you just put something in there that says something along the lines of, you know, our recommendation is that um, artificial turf would be uh, recycled and the responsibility of the, con you know, the contractor. Um, to a recycling method that is approved by the conservation commission or town agencies as such and such, you know, just to, because who knows, I mean, in eight years, the conservation commission might know a better way to recycle, or I think we have to leave that a little open-ended and, and, but at least, you know, carve out the procedure. 
to Joe's um, point, I wonder if it's something along the lines of like the most environmentally friendly recycling. Taking into account it, it, the available, no. available at the time. Yeah, because this, yeah. this definitely is something, you know, this is where technology is evolving. So, right. so we can't know what, you know, five years ago, some of the things that are happening today weren't happening. But five years from now, we don't know what that technology is going to evolve to. We know that it's an important issue that folks are focused on, that industry folks, that uh, scientific folks, that, you know, the general public conservation folks everybody everybody's talking about that aspect and as jim said not just of artificial turf but all of the plastics that exist in our world today so you know i think you know there can be language that's specified um and to natasha's point you know to the technology that exists at the time that we're executing the contract, um, you know, we can we can certainly say that that is the recommendation. Um, that it not end up in, you know, we I don't know if we can, you know, say um, our expectation is that it will not end up in a landfill. That it would be disposed of in a method that is um, the most environmentally sensitive of the time, or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and you got to think at this point that we're not alone. We're not the only town grappling with these issues. Um, you've got to think that the industry, I mean, you don't want to put too much faith in it, but you have to assume the industry is going to move to where the, co the consumer is, where the customer base is on this, which is if towns start saying, I'll buy your field, but it's, I've got some, I've got some caveats. I have some, I have some requirements. Um, the industry is going to get there. Maybe, maybe not overnight, but the industry is going to get there faster than than they would otherwise. So, um, these are great. These are great points, and I've written them down. I think Natasha has too. So, you know, beyond those points, you know, we've talked about good maintenance of fields. I know the environmental group stressed organic management of fields. I don't know if we want to be quite that prescriptive given the costs associated with organic management of fields, but I did want to discuss it a little bit. Um, I mean, I think we all agree high quality maintenance of the fields is important. I just don't know if organic ma maintenance of the fields or organic management of the fields is necessarily something we should be requiring. This would be to the natural turf, obviously, but as part of our charge, we're to look at both. Right. It's a gold standard uh, from the environmental perspective. I think that we have to recognize, of course, that there are budgetary and other issues that come to play in making decision about uh, about those fields, both their installation and their maintenance. So it's it's as I as I was saying before, and we all seem to agree, this is it's a site specific kind of issue, uh, whether it's natural turf or artificial turf, that that has to be decided. And it is a budgetary issue as well as other issues. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that, you know, have we gotten the input on, um, from our own in-house DPW regarding organic turf maintenance or maintenance? I mean, I'm, how far into maintenance of our fields so Joe, I was oh, actually gonna, go. I was gonna actually reach out to you because you had forwarded an email at one point and you had put on on there um and I'm actually using it as part of the cost analysis was mm -hmm. uh, the comparison of uh, artificial turf. I think it was the Pierce field as well as the cost associated with organic and non organic organic maintenance of um I believe it was being based off of Thorndike field. Oh. Yep. So, yeah, so um, we, those are we estimates. Did that. Yeah, right? those are estimates. And again, I just. There's two things. If certainly I would get Mike Rademacher's opinion, but from from what I know, whether we go to an organic turf um, from a synthetic turf management program, 
I don't think it matters to be, you know, from a, from a, from a turf, um, from a quality of turf, from a quality of turf perspective, whether you use organic turf treatment or a synthetic turf treatment, I, I'm not sold on which is potentially going to give you a better turf. I think they're both going to produce, um, uh, you know, potentially, hopefully better results than not putting, you know, any fertilizer or, or any treatment to the turf, turf fields. It, it really, um, when we looked at three different fields, I think it was Herd, Thorndike, and it was one more escaped me at the time. Maybe it was five. I'm not sure. It, it was just, it was just money. It was uh, approximately three times as much money. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's really it. It, it. it really wasn't, it's not any additional labor. We're going to contract it out. Um, I think there is definitely other maintenance requirements to get the best results, but that's the same as synthetic turf fields, you know, uh, if we're able to rest them for a season, you're going to get a better result. If we're able to not use them at all in inclement weather, you're going to get a better result. If, um, you know, you're able to do the deep tie aeration, you're able to do other type of maintenance practices on a regular basis, you're going to get a better result, whether it's synthetic turf treatment or organic turf treatment. So again, I don't, I don't think there's any, you know, uh, the town's not leaning one way or the other, um, I think if we had all the money in the world, which, yeah, we'll try organic. That sounds fine. We'll see how it goes. We'll give it three or four years and see if there's actually better turf quality. I, I just think it's basically a budgetary question. And Joe, is it going to keep? Is it going to keep the fields open after a rain? No, absolutely not. So we're still going to have the issues we have in our opening of the you know start of the season when the fields are are that they're most vulnerable still, even yep. if it's organically maintained and the turf is of a better quality. Yeah, it's not going to matter at all. Okay. David, do organic products run off into bodies of water less? I think it's about the quantity and the type of products used. Um, I'd be curious to know a bit more about those practices, you know, I compared with what's currently done because I don't know much more about what's currently done than is reflected in the turf maintenance contracts that are reviewed for the public land management plan. And so it's sort of comparing apples and oranges to answer that question fully. I'd be interested in seeing you know, like Joe's breakdown in more detail about what uh, labor goes into each category, what exactly is being applied, um, et cetera, et cetera. In yeah. both cases, there's a um, state law about the treatment of turf um, for non-agricultural purposes. We need to test uh, the soil to see if fertilizer is needed, for example, and only in certain circumstances are you allowed to apply fertilizer. So, you know, in either case, that should be done and we should be minimizing the inputs, whether it's synthetic or um, organically managed. And there may be something similar when it comes to pesticides, herbicides, et cetera. Um, and certainly going back to uh, Joe's earlier point about the overlap between fields and CONCOM jurisdictions, their prohibitions and regulations on use of certain herbicides and application rates and methods and, and so forth. So again, that should be comparable, um, but I, I don't know that I can fully answer your question because I, I don't know like the difference between what's proposed and what's currently done. And again, it's uh, also very site specific. So I don't think you can really generalize about runoff either. It depends on where you are. But Jim, I, I would almost recommend coming from this body, you know, it's simply a 
um, you know, uh, town meeting turf committee recommends a pilot program, you know, or do, you know, be put into effect to look at the true benefits of organic turf fields. And, um, you know, let's, again, that's going to cost money, but let's let the, those who have the power of the purse to, let's try it at a couple fields. And that's what we were going to do. And let's see if it works. I mean, right now we're just guessing, you know, I don't know. I, we try for two years. I come back. I said, oh my God, this stuff is the best thing that's ever happened to the fields. I just, I don't know. You know, um, our fields are different than other municipalities fields. So I think, you know, maybe as simple as a recommendation that we, you know, look into it and further investigate and potentially try a pilot program at some fields to get better information on the matter. I don't know. I'm just thinking how to move forward with it with actually get some real data. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, I'm struck by, I'm still, you know, struck by Ian's comment when he spoke to us where he said in his experience, and he had a lot of it, you know, in his experience, 95% of fields in Massachusetts are not properly maintained. <laughs> Or not maintained to the level they should be, and that wasn't org about organic or anything. It was just you know, this is this is the reality we live with. Yeah, I mean, I was I was troubled there just because of our experience at Robin's Farm. We did that field. Yeah, Ian's company came in because we were having trouble with that field. It was closed for multiple seasons. The turf, natural grass, natural grass turf was not growing well enough to allow um, activity to happen. And I know even during our conversation with Ian, after Ian's company came in and evaluated it, assessed it, and helped to bring it up, we were seeing in our, in our meeting, folks were posting how that field currently looks, which is... Yeah, no, it's not. Which is not yeah, no, that's, to that's a my, standard that the end know. of the street for me and yeah, the field yeah. is always yeah. worse for wear. It's always worse for wear. Again, <laughs> we've poured we poured a lot of money into redoing the field and having Ian's company come in and assess the field, and it's no better than it was before we did it because it gets a lot of use and there are a lot of issues there. Again, it's a site specific type of thing. Um, as Mike, you know, points out that <laughs> maybe we should be talking about artificial turf at Robbins Farm Park. And I think one of our one of our issues we've cited is is the bacterial or cyanobacteria growth in our bodies of water. And I worry that we say, oh, organic is the solution. And if our fields aren't maintained well enough that any chemical can actually get into the field, then we're just going to have runoff, whether it's organic like manure or, or fertilizer. And then essentially we paid a whole bunch more money for something that causes the same problem as, for, as, as non-organic fertilizer. So unless there was like an overarching conclusion that like, as soon as you put in organic fertilizer, it leaches into a hard not well-maintained field, then I think we're just literally throwing money at a problem that's not going to solve the problem um, and it's going to continue to pollute our bodies of water. So, so I think there's an argument that the organic chemicals may be better in some other ways, but the, the critical thing we know is that over nutrients in our bodies of water are causing problems. And I, I don't think switching to organic is going to solve that problem unless we are maintaining the fields. And Jill, to, your, to that point, I think um, it's not just about the fields either. It's about private residents as well. And there's no jurisdiction over that. So, you know, if we're maintaining the fields organically or there is artificial turf, um, yes, it, it, it may help in some way, but it's not, it's not the entire issue. And so more education and more you know, conversations about what's happening on private residents. Um, and that's not for this real board to really dive into, but I think that's that's sort of what my my point was um, last week about the the al the the toxic blooms. Yeah. Um, the watershed takes in more than just field runoff. Yeah. Yeah. 
I have one more item on my list and then I, you know, I know it's getting late, but then I'm, I'm open to anything else anyone else has if I haven't covered it. But I, and I, this is from the environmental group. There was a recommendation that to the extent artificial turf fields are uh, constructed in new locations in town, that there should be a recommendation that they are not located near the 5% of parcels in town that have been designated by, I believe it was MAPC as, as heat islands. Right. Um, now, in general, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that, but I also realize that many fields may be quite, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming we have a number of fields that are in close proximity or directly within those heat islands. Um, because they do sort of run through that Mass Ave Broadway corridor. Um, what do people think about this? Again, I think it uh, was presented as something of the best case scenario would be to avoid those, case, those fields being artificial turf in that area. But again, uh, we'll have to see what fields are proposed uh, what they're proposed to be built with, or, you know, the, again, the site-specific stuff. David? So Joe made a point earlier about usability and why construct something that you're not going to let the community enjoy, which I think bears in this question, too. Those areas that are hotter in town, if we're honoring the recommendation that we decided on earlier about, you know, sort of setting a, a temperature limit for use, then we could run into the problem of building something that is pretty regularly, or at least supposed to be off limits to players. And again, that's increasingly likely. So, I mean, to put a fine point on it, I, I I did an analysis a while ago uh, about the increase in extreme heat days in Arlington, I'm drawing from the state's uh, climate report that came out, I think it was last summer, I want to say. And I think, you know, we're looking at an increase of like a couple of weeks worth of time in the summer where it would be above that sort of a threshold. So if you want to maintain access, then I think citing those fields away from heat islands is a best case scenario just from a usability perspective, because otherwise you're just going to be running into a problem of uh, another of our recommendations conflicting. But I guess in this case, it would be a lack of a recommendation. I think yeah, the only difference is, Dave, is the middle of the summer, those two weeks, and, you know, say it's 14 straight days in the middle of, uh, you know, July, August, the usability of those fields, you know, the need is extremely low. It, it's, you know, the demand, quite frankly, it would be easy to close the fields for 14 days in July and August and not even blink. It's the, um, you know, where you get the, where you get your use is on those shoulder seasons. So, you know, I, I know I totally understand what you're saying. I just don't think in this in that particular instance it would make too big of a of a difference as far as usage. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think when we were when we were looking at the um the report for the hazard the hazard mitigation report, I mean that report suggested to me that our problem is water and, I mean, to some degree heat, but that overwhelmingly when we look at the issues in town it's it's water it's flooding um and we may get additional heat days but as joe said those are not the days when there's high usage of um of fields um and it is those days that we're trying to uh use the fields when 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 water is the issue so you know but i, I do want to go ahead i do want to 
sorry, sorry to cut you off. I, I do want to raise the issue though that there, there's the technical issue, and then there's the the, the political issue. Um, sorry, I've got this sunlight coming in. Makes me seem uh, seem like I have rays of sun coming off me. Um, so, you know, we saw in Malden that they ended up going with Brockville infill at the field. Uh, I forget which field it was Roosevelt. 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 Um, because frankly, it was the only way they get buy-in from the neighbors who biggest concern was that they were already in a heat island and it was going to accentuate that for them. And they didn't really get into, they didn't care about the playability. That was not their issue. Their issue was they didn't want their neighborhood to get hotter than it already was. And they feared that uh, traditional crumb rubber infill and an, artif an artificial turf would do that. I can easily see communities within those heat islands um, in Arlington making the same argument. And I guess my view is, what's the harm, what's the harm in in agreeing to that recommendation from the environmental group if it means you know you get more buy-in from people who don't live in you know I mean I mean people will always raise the heat issue but if I feel like it will have much more salience and much uh, more you know political weight when it's coming from a neighborhood that's already hotter than the average neighborhood in our region. I, I feel like this is a justice issue of we should be aiming to have these fields where it is less dense and urban. Like we 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 yeah. want these fields so all of our residents of Arlington, our children can play. I also don't I think we have to own that we don't want to make it hotter for the people. I would assume this is East Arlington on the east side of town where it is already hotter because it's more densely populated. And I think, you know, that's a part of our job. So I don't I'm, see- I'm in, I'm in agreement. But I also yeah. think you have to look at accessibility. I think if you're gonna, you know, you go to like um, the justice point of view is like, you know, for access to our better fields, um, not to put one of our better fields that can be playable all the time in East Arlington, also has another message to the community. Yes, and we've also already talked about how, um, you know, we're the the crumb rubber. We've we've said no, so we're addressing heat in that respect by saying, you know, we're trying to diminish heat island effect. Like you say, um, in in Malden, they moved to the Brockville for that reason. Um, they were concerned about heat island there. They moved to a different infill. We're saying we're not going to use the crumb rubber that that does have a higher heat index to it. Um, so I think that, you know. Well, I mean, to be clear, though, in Malden, they moved to the Brockville infill, uh, infill. It didn't, the public, the neighborhood opposition did not abate. Um, I think it was, it gave the city more cover to say they were addressing the issue, but when you read the public comments, you know, nobody changed, switched from a no to a yes because of the Brock film. Well, people are very entrenched with this issue. Well, but these were neighbors. These were not necessarily environment, you know, folks from the environmental community. These were, these were the abutters who, you know, it, whether it was staged or not, I won't, I won't make, I'll take them on their word that it was legitimate. But, you know, they were very, very concerned about a hot neighborhood becoming hotter. One, one of the issues is that there's not a lot of documentation that different infills actually have a significant cooling effect. You know, you can get some cooling relative to crumb, but it's, it's not, it won't ever take you down to kind of what a natural grass field is. The other thing is that the, the blades of, of grass and the carpet also absorb heat. So, you know, even if you take out the infill issue at all, you're still going to have a hotter surface just because that plastic is going to be absorbing solar, ra solar radiation. So, And I think we've made a lot of decisions in this town, you know, to unite the East and the West, like Gibbs, for example. But I think in this one, we are not 
we don't have East Arlington soccer teams playing West Arlington soccer teams. And when you go to the East, you're going to have the crap fields and the West is the kids are playing all around town, no matter what. Yeah. Um, so I feel like the justice there is, is really looking at the people's neighborhood and, and trying to keep the green space in their neighborhood and their neighborhood cool outweighs the fact that like the field at Thompson is not made of turf in the field at, I don't know, McLennan is. Um, so I think, I think we have to be really careful here, like what is actually happening. And we don't, we don't typically assign, assi assign sports by the side of town. I'm always driving to the other, every time I have. Yeah, a so am I. Ride. So am I. I'd love it if I got a sign. Yeah. My son got a sign but, to the field closest I'm, to us. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, and I don't want to belabor it, but I hear all of it. Okay. And um, if we were to put a turf field at Poets, for instance, so you would have our best fields in town from the high school up. And what I hear all the time is that Arlington is a community that people can walk to and ride their bikes to. And that's how pretty much the mode of transportation for kids, besides parents running around and open practice and whatever. So if we were to have Herd Field, Robbins Farm Field, Poets Corner, New Turf, High School, they're all our best fields in town. In North Union, Magnolia, Robbins, Crosby, all fields that are deteriorating because they're getting a ton of use. They're not able to withstand that type of use. Again, it, it, I do think it would be, oh, of course you're going to put another $3 million project in the Heights. We would absolutely hear it. And I, the only thing I question is, you know, we're supposed to be making recommendations, you know, I think based, I don't know, I don't want to make a political recommendation and maybe let that be a project by project basis decision. <laughs> um, I just say, I, again, I, I know it here. I can, I can see my email blowing up already. You're putting another $3 million in the Heights? Um, I hear it all the time. So, is there? Well, yeah, Joe, I don't want to. I don't want to challenge you, but I mean that there's an assumption there that people want an artificial turf field, and you know, some people I, do. I, the, the, no, the people I, in the I, east might say we dodged they, a bullet, <laughs> but it's project by project, Joe. I, yeah. I don't think that's for our, our our recommendation to have to say that. I think if all of a sudden, um, you know, North Union in, in the, you know could have had the potential to have turf field, um, those neighbors might love it. We don't know that. I don't want to make that determination that they would hate it. I guess my question is, is North Union a, um, would that be a wetland issue? Because it seems in my brain that there's no wetlands there. Okay. No, no. Oh, I, I, I think, I think yeah. Thorndike, Thorndike would be one that, you know, it, honestly, it would be it, Thorndike makes the most sense from a usability standpoint to be turf field. You're going to get your biggest bank be buck, but it also has a number of conservation habitat, you know, ecological issues that probably wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't do it there. So much like the decision that was made for her. Right. right. Yeah. I, I just think we're putting so many, you know, we're, we're coming up with this report and if it's going to be project by project, I just would hate to, you know, limit the potential if for some point it did make sense to do it. Because because we're going to do that. Let's go right back to the high school. That's, you know, close enough to the area that you see heat islands. So we're not going to deal with that. But it's in a heat island. Yeah. Even Crosby Field. I mean, Crosby Field is horrible because of the money used. If any of you've been to Crosby Field, again, I'm not saying we're going to turf Crosby Field, but it potentially makes a lot of sense for that to be considered for a turf field. Again, it has a school there that's using it all the time. Um, quite frankly, it has some trees, so it'd be naturally shady. It probably wouldn't be as hot on the field it, it, itself. So again, I just don't want to put any limiting factors on it. That's just my my two cents. Joe Barr? I, I mean, it seems like could we at least say it's, you know, highly discouraged or it should only be done. That's for, what you know, I, that's where I was leading know. after this discussion, sort of raising the issue without necessarily a definitive, you must not do this, but sort of 
as part of the case-by-case anal -case analysis, please consider this. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, none, none of what we say is binding on anyone because we don't have any actual, you know, legislative or other type of authority anyway. Yeah. No. Now, that's all I have. I'm sure I've left things out, but are there some issues I've missed that Natasha's missed that really you feel like you have a burning desire to, to see in our sort of final analysis? We'll let you know Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can go with that, but you know, I'll, I'll sort of put it out there one last time here. Anything we've missed, anything we've gotten wrong, anything we've underplayed or overplayed? Well, I just, I, you know, again, I hope, and I don't know, because we haven't seen it really addressed in the separate sections, but kind of this, this notion that the problem that we're trying to address relative to Arlington is you know, playability in spring and fall when it, when we have the, you know, the most, you, you know, team, we have more sports, more teams, more users, um, you know, New England climate. Um, so something, you know, to, to look at that aspect of this, that, um, you know, deals with getting kids out earlier and allowing them to stay out later seasonally. So I'm not sure how that will come up, but I think that that's, again, I, I think I've said that from the beginning, the, you know, local issue and trying to deal with our local problem. Yeah, and what you say, Leslie, reminds me of what Ian Lacey said to us, which, you know, when he did his sort of analysis of costs, he said, you know, yes, a um, an artificial turf field, based on his analysis, would cost more, but he put in a big, big, there was a big but there. He said, but you get more per dollar per hour out of that artificial turf field than you do the, the natural turf field. And so you can't ignore that in a cost benefit analysis. Um, and I think, you know, Natasha and I are noting that, whether we note it uh, enough or, or, or point it out enough, we'll leave that to all of you to tell us. Um, so I don't want to cut off discussion, but if there's nothing more, I'd like to just get to the last item about deliverables and timeline. Are we all good though? Yep. Um, so it's been a great discussion, probably our best, our best since we began this committee. So uh, it's all kind of been leading up to this meeting. And so we will send out, if all goes well, the draft report by some point Friday before noon. The issue is um, Natasha and I are concerned that from Friday to Tuesday afternoon is not enough time for everyone to, to fully read this and come to us with comments. For some of you, it might be, you know, my hat's off to you if you give up a good chunk of your weekend to read this, um, but I, that's not my expectation. Um, we also know that there's a conflict with a meeting on Hills Hill at next Tuesday at 6 p.m., so our meeting could, you know, could potentially go past six and then we'd be running into a scheduling conflict. So we were inclined to move our meeting next week. We, we definitely want to have a committee meeting next week, but we were inclined to move it to a different, different time, preferably on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, we aren't ready to make a decision on that right now, but it would be helpful to get a sense from the committee of what times work for them on Wednesday or Thursday next week or Friday. I mean, I'm not foreclosing Friday, but. I, I could do, I could do the same time Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. 
So that would be fun. Yeah, for what it's worth, both Wednesday and Thursday are busy for me already. Actually, Thursday it would have to be later for me. Later than it, our current. It would later, have to be six or later. Later is easier for me. Jill, you said later is better? Mm -hmm. I can do the earlier, but later is better. So and by later, you mean like a uh, six or seven o'clock meeting? On Wednesday or Thursday or both? Oh, it seems like most people can only do Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. I could do Wednesday anytime. Yeah, late, later is fine. Okay. Except not good for David to be later. That just appeared in the comments. He's He's got a conflict at 730. So yeah. could we maybe six? Does that work with Leslie? No. I may not. I I might be running into it. Well, running into the meeting, I could be late. We'll, we'll figure this out. We'll find, Natasha and I will thread the needle and find something. And you know, we may need a lot of time. We may need less time than I think. Um, you know, we can also talk through things, but people can also send us comments. You know, there's, there's that option too, uh, which might actually be even more productive because then we have something right there in writing, but. Um, is is the report going to be sent as a separate attachment and not included as part of a full packet? I mean, yes. The, the packets yes. have become very unwieldy. Yes, no, we will send it as a separate attachment. Okay. And I'd be glad to, even though I can't make Wednesday or Thursday, I'd be glad to provide written comments uh, to the committee if that's helpful. I would like to ask one quick question. Um, for me, sometimes I find it's challenging to read such a large document on the computer. Does anybody have a preference that they would like a copy printed out? Um, and if that is the case, I could likely maybe get that to you. Um, but I don't know, everyone has a different a different preference. We, we'll do that for our Board of Health for some I, meetings. I'd but. say you should have a really, really strong preference for that because Natasha is not being a... Uh... Yeah. Is too humble to tell you that she's she's spread very thin right now on this, as am I. So I don't, I, if we can avoid having Natasha have to hand deliver hard copies to folks, that would be my preference. I'm happy with the computer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy with, as long as it is separate from everything else. Right. Got it. We'll do. Right. Um, second piece of this is, so we would meet next week, Wednesday or Thursday, to be determined. We'll, we'll make that determination when we send up before we send out the agenda on Friday. Um, the expectation would be we would, so after this meeting, the expectation is three more meetings with the thinking being a meeting next week to discuss the draft, a meeting the following week, probably on the Tuesday again, to, uh, we call it, we don't want to call it a public hearing, but a public input meeting where we would have more interaction with the public than just through chat. And my preference for that meeting would be an in-person meeting, um, which Natasha is trying to find a location, probably at town hall or, or at the senior center that would work, or the community center. Um, we can work through whether we also have a hybrid option for that, but my preference would be that the committee members actually be present for that in person, if possible. Which, which date is that? And a final, sorry? Which date would be that particular meeting? Probably just our traditional Tuesday Tuesday meeting time. So uh, it would be the, the second. April 2nd. Yeah. April 2nd, are we talking about? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. At 5 p.m. That may be subject to change, but that would be our operating assumption that it would be at that date and time. Yeah. And Joe, then a the final park... meeting the following week. Probably... Sorry, Natasha. I was just going to say, Joe, does the park committee meet that night on the 2nd? Okay. No. And then a final meeting, probably on, unless unless there's a reason to change it on on Tuesday, April 9th at five p.m. where we would we would get together one last time, take into account uh, whatever we've heard of public comment, review a final final report, final draft, discuss it. I'm hoping this will be a very, rather efficient meeting. <laughs> discuss it and then take a vote. Make a vote of the committee of whether we endorse the report. And then in that case, depending, you know, endorse with, you know, edits, endorse with whatever, but the idea would be that we would release the report officially, the final, final report 
some point on the 11th or 12th of that week, in April 11th or 12th, which, you know, is before town meeting. It's a good 10 days, I think, before town meeting begins. So not the 30 days, but still well before town meeting. I think we can do this. I think, you know, taking a little extra time, which by the way, we did send the letter to the board of selectmen in the town or the select board and the town manager, a uh, town moderator. And, um, you know, they seem comfortable so far the input has been, they seem comfortable with us taking you know, just a little extra time to get this right, including the public input part. So <laughs> Natasha and I have our work cut out for us in the next uh, 48 to 72 hours, but I will just say that Natasha will be reaching out to some of you individually. We have some questions as we've merged all the narratives. There are some, some things that sometimes raised a question for us, like certain sentences were like, this doesn't make any sense, or things that seem too good to be true, like what's the sourcing for this? Are you sure that that's accurate? Not a lot, but you know, three or four or five places throughout the document when we merged it. Natasha will reach out to each of the people who wrote each narrative individually. And when she does so, I, I have only one request, which is please respond to her as soon as possible, because we're really up against it in terms of timing. So if she sends these emails to you tonight or tomorrow, please respond within 24 hours with a full response. Um, you know, these will be very, uh, you know, discrete questions, but they require fairly immediate answers. And I think that's all I have. <laughs> um, I, just, I just had one little addition here, and that is to thank Natasha. I'm, I'm part of many organizations, and I've seen lots of minutes from meetings, and I have rarely, if ever, seen such complete, thorough, and accurate minutes. Yeah. And yeah, we couldn't do this without her. <laughs> Natasha's a superstar there, yes. Let's yeah. not be crazy, Leslie. I'm crazy. <laughs> I've give, seen it, give too. Give that woman yeah. a raise. Yeah. yeah, she's she's amazing. And um, it's been a joy to work with her on this project when we're almost there. We're almost yeah. there. And I feel like the final product, obviously, you, you will all be the judge, but the final product, I feel like will be something we're working towards where every member of this committee can proudly stand behind it, whether they agree with it 100 percent or 95 percent or 85 percent, you know, by and large, they just look at it and say, yeah, this is a job well done. And this is the product of many, many months and many meetings, but we stand behind these recommendations. That's that's the goal. And I think we're very close to reaching it. So for so such a controversial you, subject, it's been a healthy discussion with a an open-minded group of people. And well, I that's, that's the key. Positive. I, I think we have a really healthy the debate here and people can disagree without being disagreeable and frankly there's been a lot more agreement than disagreement in this group because I feel like there's been uh, everyone's been incentivized personally to um, try to get to yes here on something we can all agree on and stand behind so I'm really impressed with this group it's been great thank you all and as you can see the natural light is starting to diminish so I think that's a sign for us to go have dinner um or adjourn. Move to adjourn. Uh, now, any new business before I entertain a motion to this to uh, to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. So, Mike. Just call and the roll. Norman. Okay. Uh, so we'll go right down the list here. Uh, Jill. Yes. Uh, Marvin. Yes. Uh, Jim. Yes. Leslie. Yes. Mike. You bet. Natasha. Yes. <laughs> yes. There was I'm hesitation. Sorry. You just want to stay. Wow. And uh, Jill Barr. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have, Have a, a great, great night. night. Thanks. Okay. Bye. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.